Good morning. How's everybody after this weekend? We had a really good weekend. Um, took the boys out for pizza and putt-putt golf Saturday night. Went to the lake yesterday. It was great. Got in a last-minute live stream last night. Hope you were able to join me for that. Um, Saturday was the Alverton Plow Days, which I've posted videos of before. And uh, I went again, took a little video for you. So let's roll that footage. Well, good morning. We're uh, a little special one today. We're at the Alberton Plow Days in Alberton, Ohio. It's uh, kind of the Ohio side of our farm here at Waldron. And uh, they have this plow day every year. A bunch of antique tractors come out, do some plowing. If you've seen some of my super old videos, you may have seen the uh, Big Bud with the 21 bottom plow out here a few years ago. Um, that tractor is not here today, but there's a bunch of antiques, some pretty cool stuff. So we'll do a little quick view of what we've got going on around here. I'll show you a few of the different tractors. Spectator tractor. I want to see him hook a plow up. You'll see. You'll see. Just a second. Look at this deal. Mini bud. There we go. That's close to what my tractor is like. That's, a, that's an F30. That's a much bigger one. Mine's an F12. He's struggling a little bit. Low ground back here with a water pond and it's a little heavy. There's another one. What number is on this one? That one's an F20. Needs more weight. We got a John Deere D maybe? I don't know. I don't know my antique gear numbers, but... Too deep. Pretty cool. There is uh, quite a range of ages of tractors out here. Uh, you mean them formals are from the 30s most likely. Uh, they've requested all tractors be at least 40 years old. So that would be 1971 or older. So this one here, the next two here are some of the newer ones. John Deere 4520. We used to have a tractor like that. That's got a one, two, three, four, five, five bottom. And then we've got an international here. I don't see a number tag on there, so I don't know. Also a five bottom. Cool. Then we've got uh, an Alice. right there is why tractors are safer today. Guys hanging off the back, adjusting the plow, steering, yeah. I mean, it is what it is, but. <laughs> 806 International pulling a deer plow. Is that allowed? Four bottom. There you go. There's your Oliver with front wheel assist. Screaming. 1466 International. Alice. This one here's got an extra 20 horsepower from the chrome straight pipe there. Definitely is the uh, the oldest one here, and yeah, pretty cool. Well, 
there's a lot of tractors here. I don't know how many. I'll talk to the guys that own the farm here sometime and they'll tell me. But uh, had a good chicken barbecue lunch. A lot of the tractors are stopped because they're eating. I'm going to go right around just a little bit more and then we're going to head back to the farm. I've got some mowing to do today. It's been about an hour and a half. Most of the tractors are shut down right now for lunch. But <laughs> it does not take long when you've got 50 tractors here to, to get a bunch of plowing done. Just uh, cruise by some of the tractors they got set in here. Massey Harris. Uh, Massey Ferguson. The newer deer, that's a 4020. That one's a 4010. That one's cool. 420 crawler. Pulling the tube at him. Alright, well that was cool. I'm uh, heading back to the farm now. Uh, before we wrap up the plow day stuff here, a uh, couple of quick notes. They do it for fun once a year on that field or one of the fields in the area. It's not something that is widely done around here. Every year I post this video and somebody comments about how terrible plowing is or what a waste of time it is and why is all these people out there gawking in their golf carts and gators and stuff. It's a plow day, guys. It's just for fun. It's for the old timers to bring their old tractors and their little plows, get them out of the barn, work them, and have a little bit of fun for a day. It's a fundraiser. The local fire department does the um, chicken barbecue. They've got some of the other tractor groups and stuff around doing fundraisers and stuff. It's the little town festival for Alberton, and it's, it's just for fun. So... Yeah. Anyway, we'll see you Monday, or maybe it is Monday and I'm posting. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing with this footage. So we have got maybe a little bit of a short week here. I've got some stuff going on at the end of the week I'll talk to you about later. Um, but for right now here this morning, I, I've i been putting off this uh, spraying this manganese with this little sprayer for a couple of weeks now. It needs to get done. I'm going to go and do it. I thought about, gosh, not, but... It'll help, it'll work, I'll explain it in a second. So we're gonna get this little sprayer loaded up, get this last bag of manganese sprayed out on the muck pockets where we need it, and then we'll be done with the sprayer. Brock can winterize it, we can get it put back away in the barn. That'll be good. Okay, so what we're spraying here is this Tech Mang. It is a uh, manganese sulfate, 19% sulfur, 32% manganese. Um, basically the Super high organic muck soils, organic matter muck soils that we have tie up manganese and make it unavailable to our soybeans. Our soybeans then turn yellow. Sorry, I gotta, we need 400 gallons. I'm trying to figure out where exactly it's at. Um, and so we spray this on them foliar to get it into the plant. It turns them green within a matter of days. Works really well, so uh, we're gonna go spray this out where we need it. Okay, so like I said, uh, manganese sulfate. Um, we've just got that one or two fields that have some really heavy muck, high organic matter, uh, it ties it up. We're gonna fix that problem. We've already sprayed them all once with this, uh, but that was over a month ago, so it's time to give them another shot. This is the last bag of it we've got. It's a 55 pound bag of a dry powder, and um, we put on two pounds to the acre. So. I'm going to spray 15 gallons of the water. We should be able to cover 27-ish acres with our 400 gallons or just a touch more. And then we'll be done with this. Okay, so here's some of our yellow beans. We're going to do our best to stay in Brock's tracks, where there are tracks anyway, and uh, spray them. Oh my. Uh, there's quite a sprayer rut there. I don't remember making that one. I should have not driven in it. Anyway, that's why we don't use the big sprayer on this because we make giant ruts. The next pass over is the one that I then skipped after I almost got stuck doing that. This was when we sprayed fungicide on this field a few weeks ago. So yeah, this slow ground here is some of the wetter stuff and it's muck and it's soft and it's just not fun to spray. Uh, you can see the yellow beans around the perimeter there. And don't mind the crooked driving. I'm just following Brock's tracks from the last time he was out here. But yeah, um, that's that's why we're using this sprayer because this ground is just so soft and it's so easy to get 
caught or stuck or could cause major problems with the big sprayer and I don't want to do it. I just finished that field across the road and I jumped over here because we got a little pocket um, in the center in the front here that needs some manganese and I see a new problem in our soybeans. Fantastic. So I'm looking out the window of the cab and I see these yellowing leaves. You guys see those? Do you see it? That's not white mold. That is SDS or uh, um, sudden death syndrome. I am gonna send some pictures to Wade to double check and verify, but I'm almost positive when you see the green veins, yellow and brown tissue uh, between them, that's sudden death syndrome. Next problem up to kill our beans. Fantastic, yay. But hey, at least there's no white mold out here. All right, well, we've covered 20, Seven and a half, almost 28 acres, which is what we were supposed to get. My tank is just about empty. It didn't actually run empty, but close enough. We've got to do a rinse um, tank here before we put it away anyway. So I'm going to take it back. I covered what I needed to cover. Um, tomorrow, Brock's supposed to be here. I'll have him run a little fresh water in it just to rinse everything. We'll just spray it out on some wheat stubble or something. Just water. <laughs> and... Um, and give it a quick power wash, winterize it, RV antifreeze, put it in the barn. Okay, slight change of plans. Um, not that I've told you what the plan was, but anyway, um, Dad, when I got back, Dad was here. He was uh, wanting to go look at, over there where we're tiling, there's two fields. They're tiling the backfield. We've got some stuff to do in the front field, but there's a big hole in the back corner of that one that uh, we're trying to get some dirt to fill it in. And the neighbors, the, the hole is kind of a big drowned out spot between our field and the neighbor's field. There's a ton of dirt on the west side of the ditch over there, but it's on the neighbor's side and they didn't plant a lot of it. So dad wants to move some dirt over there, use our big pans and pull the dirt off of their bank and fill in the hole on both of our sides to keep, keep the water off and, and keep it from drowning out more or less. So we went over and looked at that a little bit. We need to do some more mowing, uh, knock down some more of the weeds. And so we need this tractor. So instead of me waiting for Brock to come tomorrow to flush this, we're going to go do that now because I have to have this tractor to uh, operate the sprayer. Uh, the controls and everything are in it. So we're going to we're gonna put just a 100 or 200 gallons of water in, find a wheat field, spray it out, and then um, uh, we can unhook this and we can use the forklift or anything else, any other thing to move it around and to winterize it later. We just have to have this tractor to actually spray out of it. So, in fact, I might winterize it too, just so I can flush it through the boom. I don't know, but whatever. So we're gonna do that. And then we're gonna get the mower hooked up and we're gonna go mow. And then we gotta get the hitch changed on the 9R so we can hook up the big pans and yeah, a whole, all kinds of stuff. Plans for the day. Okay, I flushed it. We're gonna put four or five gallons of RV antifreeze in and run it so that it's coming out all the nozzles. And then it'll be winterized and we can get it unhooked and then Brock just can power wash and put it away tomorrow. Okay, well, it took seven gallons, but everything's got pink coming out at the nozzles and uh, through the whole um, agitation system. All the lines are filled with RV antifreeze, which means it won't break when it gets cold this winter. All right, we're done with that for now. Uh, we got to change PTO shaft and then uh, get the mower hooked up. So this mower just has a, a leg for a, a stand on a jack there, which apparently likes to sink in the ground even with a board under it. Um, but anyway, you just gotta use the hydraulics to raise and lower the, the tongue up so we can get hooked up. So if I put this down, you can see the tongue comes up till we get it lined up. Now we gotta back up. Then we stick the pin in and we should be able to pull ahead and it should drop down, should. Slowly. Got it. All right, it is um, it's almost lunchtime, so I'm, that's ready to go. I'm gonna park it there. If dad wants to go run it this afternoon, I'm gonna let him. If not, then we'll go and do it. Um, we've also gotta get the scraper hitch put on the 9R, so gotta do that. that. It's a pretty quick job, but it's gotta be done. All right, well, I'm not sure what the last thing that I filmed was, to be honest, um, but it was a while ago, because I went to lunch, I had to take some papers to the 
health department about well and septic stuff. Um, and then we had some, my parents' friends that moved to Tennessee 10 years ago were here and visiting for a while, so I sat and visited with them. And anyway, Dad's got this tractor out, and I asked him, did you just move that out of the way because you were cutting logs, or is it out for a reason? He said, well, there's a reason. Um, and it has to do with that dirt that we're going to move over there. So in order to hook up the scrapers to this 9R, we have to change the hitch. So that is the drawbar, uh, the ag drawbar that we use to hook up to all of our equipment, chisel plow, field cultivator, you know, all the stuff that we pull with that tractor. What we need <coughs> is that black one down there. And we're going to have to dig it out of here. But it has that hitch, that end on it. Uh, that is for attaching to scraper drawbar. So we gotta pull the old one out. We gotta dig this one out, and we gotta swap them. So this is surprisingly easy to do. Um, basically, we're just gonna pull it out. We're gonna wrap a chain around there and around the forklift, and then we got one pin we gotta pull, and I'll show you that in a second. So there's that. So we gotta crawl under here. And here's the drawbar. It goes all the way back up there. Oh, look, it's not even packed full of dirt. What a deal. So, up on top of there, there's a piece that holds that down. Let me see. Can you see it from up there? Yeah. Look at that. So, we've got to lift this and rotate it out of the way. But I got to get better leverage. There. Okay. Now that pin should pop right up out of there. I might have to get a hammer and pound it out. See through the hole? Can you see through the hole? There we go. Okay. So once we get the pin out, then we go back over to our forklift and we pull. just comes right out what's going on well I guess I need to take these bolts out here um, they do slide past that if it's centered just right I don't have it centered just right so we're just gonna take them out we gotta take them out anyway to put the other one in now we can pull it out and once we get it most of the way we'll just kind of lift up with the front of the forklift to the back try and keep it on the forks which I'm not doing a very good job of there we go and we got it. So we're gonna set this one off to the side for right now while we dig the scraper hitch out. Let's see if I can pick this up without dropping it or flipping it. And get it out of here. A little tight. So then we just kinda slide it back in there eventually yeah we're gonna have to lift it up on the other end but we'll get it uh, in the right spot we'll put the pins back in and it's good I think I think when we put the ag hitch back in we might want to replace those bolts probably should do it now but I don't have them so we're gonna put these ones back in it'll be fine um, so this hitch is wider at the back end than the other one is so the bolts go in different holes here and here versus yeah. Anyway, we're good to go here. Looks like Dad was busy sawmilling over the weekend. Got his wagon back from Brock and got her stacked full of wood now. So the other thing that I would do if it wasn't already done is take any of the excess weight that I can get off easily off. Um, but we've already done that. There is still a donut there. That one is not easy to get off because it bolts through the rim and you got to take all of it off. And uh, so that one stays. But I don't have the other two donuts on. We don't have any of our suitcase weights on this tractor. Because those scrapers add a ton of weight to the back of the tractor. And so you want to be as light as you can with the tractor and use the scrapers for ballast. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we change hitches. Um, 
Honestly, I don't really understand it all or why, but I know with the scrapers, you want that weight to be attached as close to the rear axle as possible. Uh, in fact, a lot of these tractors are special built for scrapers, what they call a scraper special, and they have a whole different rear end um, that doesn't have any of that framing and stuff around where the, the hitch is, and there's just a, a basically that hitch bolt solid right to the axle. So, um, But this works for us because we don't do that much with the scrapers. It's nice to have and use a little bit when we need it um, and for projects like this, but we can use the tractor for what really makes us money. So if you don't know, this is what I'm talking about by scrapers. We've got a set of 14-yard Reynolds scrapers, uh, doubles, and we're going to attempt to get this hooked up here. And we get to pull the same maneuver we did with them, uh, with that mower because there's no jack on this, so you get to use the hydraulics to raise and lower this um, hitch here. Okay, got them hooked up. It's a little more difficult than an ag hitch, too, because you got to get that pin lined up through all four or six of those ears there on that uh, hitch, and it's, it's not easy. So uh, we probably should check tires and stuff on this. Dad's the one that's going to run it, not me, so I'm just going to park it for right now and go mow. And uh, if he wants me to go through it more and check stuff over, I can. Otherwise, I'll let him do it. All right, let's go knock down some weeds and I'll show you guys um, what the plan is with moving dirt and how what exactly we're gonna do. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, this corn is not ours, it's the neighbors. And this low ground here is a spot that always drowns out. They put some dirt in here, I think it was last summer or last fall. And that's our wheat field right next to it. We're tiling in the back. There's a ditch right here that kind of splits those two fields. Uh, and we've got a wet hole on our side of the line. They've got a wet hole on their side of the line. We want to fill it all in so that neither of us have a wet hole anymore. There's a lot of dirt piled up along this ditch on their side of it here that um, could be used to fill in this hole. And we can use our scrapers to scrape it off of there and haul it in. But look how high it is along the ditch there versus out in the field. There's a big mound before it drops off. So Dad wants to move all of that dirt out of there and haul it down here and to fill into this hole so that it uh, it forces the water into the ditch rather than into this low ground or into a, at least into a surface outlet or something. So um, we're going to mow this down so we can get a good lay of the land and see how it looks. Uh, the neighbor said something about coming over here tonight and looking at it with us just so we can get a good idea of uh, and make sure everybody's on the same page. And uh, yeah, it should, should, should benefit both of us. Well, that might be as close as I am going to get. It is super wet over there, I almost got stuck, and it is super wet right there, I almost got stuck. Might be able to get a little on the other end, the north side, but uh, yeah, that's that's all wet. So, I don't know. I don't know what we're going to do with that. Good thing I didn't just take off through the middle of that there. Hum rock. Guys, it's a joke. Get over it. Brock got stuck this spring because he went through the middle of a wet hole. I give him a hard time about it. It's okay. He doesn't mind. Well, I just chased out the bucks. There goes one. Can you see him running down there? There's two of them. Whoa. A couple of good sized ones. And I was going to show you the ragweed pollen cloud behind me, but I'm in a little tough situation right here. Try not to roll a tractor. Whoa. Must be a surface inlet right there. All right, get turned around and heading back up towards the low ground. I was mowing some of this stuff along the ditch here that uh, it's got all the dirt where we're trying to pull from. All right, well, meeting of the mines in the field. Uh, Dad has been working some tile lines down, and he's going over to what we just mowed and going to rip it up so he's got some loose dirt to move. Good deal. So I'm done mowing for tonight. We do have some more mowing to do. Um, I might have Brock do a little bit tomorrow. Uh, in addition to cleaning up that sprayer, Dad's got some other stuff he needs done. I feel like I haven't done anything real interesting today. So, I don't know how long this video is to this point. But we're going to go do a little crop scouting. It's about 5.30, so not for very long. But, let's go pull some corn ears and see how our maturity is coming on our corn and how what the development looks like. And uh, maybe we'll stop in at a field or two and check for aphids where we've already sprayed, see if we've 
got any coming back or if they're all dead or um, let's go look plus we'll stop down to my house they've been working on that today I had a couple of questions in last night's live stream about the double crop beans and that's right here they look pretty darn good as you can see we've pretty well canopied except for on the ends where they're a little thin here but you get out in the field they look great um, they're growing they're still they're still short they still got a long ways to go but for beans that were planted July 3rd 4th something like that they look they look really good um, I have noticed we've got some holes in the leaves we've got some some insect feeding happening and that'll happen a lot of times with double crop or late beans because they're the they're the they're, they're just at a different growth stage so you kind of concentrate the bugs that are looking for them so yeah you can see all those bigger holes there that's from uh bean beetles or grasshoppers or or something of the sorts um there's a little frog eye leaf spot it looks like and otherwise i don't see a ton of disease i had been finding a fair amount of aphids in these, although that trifolia is pretty clean. There's one on the stem or the petiole. Um, so not too bad. I am keeping an eye on them for insecticide to see if we need to spray them. Right now I would say no. There went one of the bean beetles. See him squirming around right there? That little guy is what's eating the leaves. Yeah. There's more aphids on that leaf. Not something I'm gonna pull a trigger on spraying, at least not yet. They're double crop beans. Got a long way to go to make something. You can see though, we do have flowers. Lots of flowers on that plant. Good signs, all good things. Well, not all good things. Good things are happening, bad things are bugs. Okay, walking out into a cornfield here. This one I picked specifically because it did not get any fungicide on it. Not a tassel, not early. So I wanted to see how bad is the disease pressure and what does it look like? So we've got some northern corn leaf blight right there. I saw a lot of it on the lower leaves. That's all northern. So that's not a great thing. Um, there is some other patchies, uh, patchiness, a little bit of um, gray leaf spot it looks like. But nothing, I mean, there, yeah, that's gray leaf spot there. I don't see any tar spot on this particular leaf right in here. Something I've been watching for, for the most part, healthy, especially for not having any fungicide. Let's look at an ear. Okay, this is going to be a quick trip because the mosquitoes are terrible out here. Um, not a terrible ear. We're in a pretty crappy spot in this field right in the corner, so uh, I don't expect to see great things, but... You can see a fair amount of tip back. So what this is, is um, uh, the end of the ear that either did not pollinate or has aborted since it pollinated. And I'll show you the difference when we get out of the field here. So if you look real careful at the tip on this ear, you'll see a few different things here. But we've got uh, these big yellow kernels. Let me turn the uh, stabilizer off so it focuses. But... So the big yellow kernels, obviously they pollinated, they're filling out, they're gonna form actual kernels. But then if you look, you'll see some shriveled up yellow ones that just, they, they started and then they've died. Those kernels have been aborted off. Basically, something has stressed this plant enough for it to say, hey, I can't, I can't fill out this many kernels. We gotta abort some of them to protect the rest of the ear. And so that's what these ones are. And then up here on the tip of it, those ones never actually pollinated. They just didn't get started and developed. Right about there is the line and the difference. And so, um, you know, those ones, whether we ran out of pollen and the silks didn't grow fast enough, whatever it was, they didn't pollinate. So um, not a terrible ear. Is this great corn? No, but it should be good corn. We'll take a look at these beans real quick. This is one of the earliest fields that we sprayed for aphids. Well, aphids and fungicides. So um, right away, what I can see are pods that are filling out, hanging right up here on the top. They're getting depth to them. That's a good thing. That means they're they're working through the maturing process. Um, there's a dead plant. I assume white mold. I don't see too many of them, so not a huge problem. But let's look and see what we got for aphids. Well, I didn't count every leaf or look at every leaf on that plant, but I found one. So that's good. Our insecticide worked. What I see here actually is very promising. There's a lot of pods on this plant. They're filling out. They look good. We got a lot of pods on these lower nodes. I mean, there is one, two, three, four, five 
pods just on that one node. We've got branches with pods. These actually are, are I'm more encouraged about our beans after looking at that one plant than I have been for a while because I was getting pretty negative about our uh, soybean potential. All right, well, I uh, I stopped at Phil's house across the road over there. He's putting a patio in. He was out curious how things were going. And now it's 6.30, so I'm going home. So you'll have to look at my house another day. Thanks for watching today, everybody. Look who it is. I felt so bad. <laughs> Look who it is. Anna's home. And there's Mom. Mom, when's your cooking channel start? Yeah, she's advertising for me. All right, see you guys tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Questions, comments, all that stuff, leave them down below. See ya.